Good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the 2022 Rodney and Lorna Sawatsky Lecture, presented this evening by Dr. Regina Sean Stoltzfus, entitled Resistance Strategies, Equipping Ourselves and Our Communities for Long-Term Justice Work. I'm Troy Osborne, a Dean of the College, and on behalf of all my colleagues here at Grable, I'd like to welcome you to Conrad Grable University College, the virtual version. I'll begin tonight with some words of acknowledgement and, and uh, words of gratitude. Uh, first, I wish to acknowledge that Conrad Grable University College is situated on the traditional territories of indigenous peoples of the Adirondaran, Adirondaran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee peoples. Mennonites settled in the area we now we know today as Waterloo Region in the early 1800s, but in 1784, the Haldeman Proclamation uh, had granted this land to the Haudenosaunee, known as the Six Nations, to support them in perpetuity. And the Haldeman Tract is 10 kilometers on either side of the Grand River from end to end. Grable continues the ongoing work of learning about the land and the people who live on it. And we look forward especially to working on this story a little bit more on the upcoming conference, Indigenous Mennonite Encounters in Time and Place, to be held here at Grable in May as an opportunity to offer stories and analyses of encounters and relationships between Indigenous peoples and Mennonite settlers from point of contact until the present. Uh, you can register for this event on our website, but even if you can't make it, I encourage you to learn about the land you live on wherever you are joining us from this evening. The Rodney and Lorna Sawatsky program has enriched our teaching and, and uh, community education programs since 2004. The series honors the legacy and contributions of Rod and Lorna Sawatsky to Grable, the University of Waterloo, and this community. Dr. Rodney Sawatsky joined the faculty of Conrad Grable College in 1974, teaching history, Mennonite studies, religious studies, and peace and conflict studies. His scholarship continues to inform the fields of Mennonite history, life, and thought. He was Dean at Grable from 1974 to 1989 and president from 1989 to 1994. He then was president of Messiah College in Pennsylvania for 10 years prior to his death in 2004. And Lorna lives in this community and is an active participant in its life and, and may be here this evening, but I can't see her on the screen. So I wanna thank you, the Sawatsky family and their many friends who have made this visiting scholar program possible. And uh, Regina's already had a chance to visit a class with us today and we look forward to continuing conversations with her tomorrow. Uh, before we begin, I want to also acknowledge and thank several people who've made tonight's lecture possible. In my office, I'd like to thank Birgit Marzinski for overseeing the reservation process, and I'd like to thank the communications team, especially Jen Conkle and Margaret Gissing. Uh, if you are having technical problems, you can contact Margaret in the chat, and she may be able to, to help you out. Following the lecture tonight, there will be a question and answer period. Uh, I will give you more information on how we'll manage that following the lecture. The lecture itself will be recorded, uh, but the Q&A will not be. So it's my pleasure now to introduce and welcome Dr. Regina Sean Stoltzfus. Uh, she currently teaches at Goshen College in Indiana and chairs the Religion, Justice, and Society Department. She is co-founder with Tobin Miller Shear of the Roots of Justice Anti-Oppression Program, uh, formerly known as the Damascus Road Anti-Racism Program. She and Tobin are the co-authors of the new book, Been in the Struggle, Pursuing an Anti-Racist Spirituality, published just last November by Herald Press. In that book, uh, the authors reflect on their nearly 30 years of work at dismantling racism and offer reflection and practical direction to sustain those who work to dismantle racism, no matter how long they've been working at it. Regina has worked in peace education with Ohio Conference of the Mennonite Church, Mennonite Central Community US, and Mennonite Mission Network. She holds a Master of Arts degree in Biblical Studies from Ashland Theological Seminary and a PhD in Theology and Ethics from Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, Regina teaches in the Peace and Justice, oh, I said that already. Her, her courses include Race, Class and Ethnic Relations, Personal Violence and Healing, Spiritual Path of the Peacemaker and Transforming Conflict and Violence. Regina is the recipient of the State of Indiana's 2016 Spirit of Justice Award the highest award conferred by Indiana Civil Rights Commission, and she's the 2021 recipient of the Everance Journey Award. So it's our, our honor and pleasure to have her here this evening. Uh, so thank you, Regina, for joining us this evening. We look forward to hearing your presentation and then continuing the, the conversation in the Q&A afterwards. So I invite you to make sure your mics are muted 
uh, perhaps mute, turn off your camera as well during the lecture. But uh, welcome, a warm welcome to you tonight, Regina. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very, very much. It is my pleasure to be here, my honor and pleasure to be here. I bring you all greetings from Goshen and from Goshen College, which is situated on the traditional land of the Potawatomi and Miami's pe Miami peoples, past and present. And we honor their stewardship of this land in the past and now. As I begin talking with you this evening, I want to reach back to the middle of the 20th century and describe for you what was, for many people, a perfectly normal facet of life in many US cities, especially, but not only in the Southern part of the country. Montgomery, Alabama in 1955 had a population of about 126,000 people. It had been before abolition, a slave holding state and it was the first capital of the Confederacy, which later moved to Virginia. It was not unusual or unique for the citizens of the city to live, in, to live racially segregated lives. Of particular note was segregated public transportation, the buses, and you might see where this story is going. So, Racial segregation, United States, not a secret part of our history, a big part of our history. But I'd like to explain to you the way that segregation worked on these buses. You might have seen old historical photos with those signs that directed people to where they could be in many public places according to race, a white only section and a black section, or to use the language of the time, a colored section. And here I make a side note about the language of colored, um, a way of talking about black people, African-Americans, uh, back in the segregation days. Um, and the term that you might be familiar with now and maybe use yourself, people of color, and just say that those two terms, as I remind my students, especially those for whom English is not their first language or people who were not socialized in North America, that there is a distinction between those and colored people is now considered a pejorative term for black people um, in the US. And so, but it, those signs would have definitely said colored people, colored only, white only. And indeed there were white sections and black sections on the bus, whites in the front, black people in the back. At that time, 1955, 75% of the ridership were black people. So the black section of the bus actually had more seats. Black people were not to sit in the white section. By city ordinance, the procedure was that if the white section of the bus became full, Black people who were sitting in the Black section had to move so that a white person could sit down. Another custom in this system, which was not enforced by every bus driver, concerned how Black people could get on the bus. There were two doors, one in the front, where the driver and the box into which the rider dropped their fare was, and a door at the back of the bus. Some drivers required that their black passengers come in the front door, pay their fare, exit and walk to the back door and enter from there. If the driver happened to be feeling particularly frisky on any certain day, they might drive off with the fare and without the passenger who had just paid it. You are probably guessing that I'm going to talk about December 1st, 1955, the day that Rosa Parks, a 42-year-old 42, 42 African-American woman, refused to give up her seat for a white man and was arrested, and I will. But I'm telling this story to illustrate one part of the socialization process of systemic racism. And we could parallel the stories that I tell tonight, this story and others that I'll tell tonight, with socialization processes, with other systems that marginalize and, excludes pe and exclude people. I will be focusing specifically on race. 
As I said at the beginning, these behaviors participating in an unjust system were normalized. The motivations differ, of course, depending upon who you are in the scenario. And I have to think about the formation of identity that gets rolled up into these, let's call them what they are, these ritualized behaviors. I look at the way that the bus system, the segregated bus system worked in the city as a form of ritualized behavior that continually, for some people twice a day riding the bus to and from work, uh, tell them who they are in the society that they live in. This part about the behaviors and the way that the bus works and how it fits into a socialization process that the whole country is engaged in gets left out of the truncated story that most of us learn about Rosa Parks. And that is that mythologized version that props up an amazing heroic person that accomplishes what us mere mortals could never do. And I don't for a moment discount the heroism of Rosa Parks and what she means to my history, to our history. But absent the larger story around Parks and her family and her community, we lose a valuable lesson about what it means to build communities of resistance that are in the struggle against oppression and injustice for the long haul. I am a first generation Northerner, a descendant of enslaved people. One of my cousins, one of my Shan's cousins has done research on our family and the Scottish immigrant slaveholders from whom the name Shan's comes. My parents born in the 1930s were part of what is called the great migration, the huge exodus of African-Americans leaving the South for my family that was Florida, Tennessee and South Carolina. Isabel Wilkerson, author of the book, The Warmth of Other Sons, the epic story of America's great migration, writes that in the great, writes that the great migration is perhaps the biggest underrepresented story of the 20th century. Over the course of six decades, beginning in 1910, six million black Southerners left the South for the North, the Midwest, and the Western part of the United States. They left for the same reasons migrants around the world leave their homes, for better opportunities or opportunities period in jobs, housing, education, and so forth. I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. And when I was two years old, my family moved into the neighborhood where I lived until I left for college. Shortly after moving into that neighborhood, we were invited to church. And that is how I became a second generation black Mennonite. My home church had just been planted in the late 50s by mission workers. And from the beginning as a small fellowship, our congregation was inter, in, intentionally interracial. I was a child in the 1960s. I remember the racial unrest in our city and cities across the country, although I didn't live in places where that came very close to our own neighborhood. I remember the day that Dr. King was murdered. And these were things that we talked about at home, at school, and at church. The narratives of the Black struggle for liberation and Anabaptist peace theology were the narratives that shaped my thinking and my life. When I was nine years old, I went away to an overnight camp, which was for the most part wonderful. Our camp counselors kept us busy, busy with crafts and activities. I had never been away from home with people who were not related to me. And there was something thrilling about this. I was also the only black child in my cabin and may have been the only black child at the whole camp. I don't quite remember that, but there is a moment that I do remember quite well. At one point during the week, we were paired off for an activity that included having a partner 
that we clapped hands together and held hands together as we played a game. The partner that I had been assigned to announced that she could not hold hands with me because my skin was brown. I don't remember what happened immediately after that. I'm assuming some adult intervened, made it right in some fashion, and we moved on. But my body memory of that moment, someone didn't want to touch me because of my skin color, is something that I carry with me and remember. And that memory is a combination of nine-year-old embarrassment and confusion with retrospective adult bit of anger. As I mentioned earlier, I was not uninformed. I was a black child in America and it was the 1960s, but I was raised in a predominantly African-American context. My neighborhood, the kids I went to school with, my teachers were black. My lived experience with white people was primarily at my racially integrated church where I had white friends in whose homes I had eaten, I had spent the night, we had done life together. I had never knowingly had a white person recoil at the sight of me or bristle at the thought of touching my hand. And all these years later, when I think of that moment, I am struck by the assumed of courseness of that long ago encounter. That little white girl who didn't want to hold my hand was not a bit hesitant in her declaration. Whatever her life lessons had been thus far, she knew that there was a limit to the ways in which she could interact with me. She had been taught explicitly or implicitly, I don't know, what was appropriate and what was inappropriate in the same way that those bus riders in Montgomery, Alabama had been just a few years ago. It was normal, it was expected. It's what we do or what we did at that point in history. Back to the buses. Rosa McCauley Parks, was a well-read conscious activist person who came from an activist family. Her own definition of herself was as a rebellious person. Those are her words that she used to describe herself. The circumstances around her helped shape this sense of rebelliousness that she carried with her. She was born in 1913. She was the grandchild of enslaved people her grandfather was the slave owner's son. The women in her family in particular, her mother and her grandmother, raised her to not think of herself as inferior to any person. But as a child, she witnessed the escalation of racist violence after World War I. She would have been six years old during what was called the Red Summer of 1919, when black soldiers returned from that war, expecting that they had now earned the right to be treated as equal Americans. In her town, however, churches were burned, black people were whipped and killed, dead bodies were in the streets in that summer, that Red Summer of 1919. Rosa Parks was, Rosa McCauley at that time, was an early and avid reader and was raised on the notion that a primary goal of education was learning and claiming the history of Black resistance. Jean Theo Harris is the author of a wonderful biography on Parks called The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. And she explains in that biography how Parks consciousness developed not only from events that were happening in the world, but in how her family talked about it. Quoting uh, the biography, a section of the biography, she writes, at home, the Macaulays discussed the history of slavery, the situation of blacks in Alabama, and how to survive not getting into trouble by confrontation with white people who were not friendly. Rosa's family sought to teach her a controlled anger, a survival strategy that balanced compliance and militancy. 
One of the lessons her mother imparted that lodged in Rosa's head was how the enslaved people had to fool the white people into thinking that they were happy. The white people would get angry if the slaves acted unhappy. They would also treat the slaves better if they thought that the slaves liked white people. And as Rosa became aware of the terms of white supremacy, the fact that acting happy produced better treatment stuck in her throat. She longed for ways to contest this treatment, but she well understood the punishment for resistance." End quote. Parks would constantly, as an adult, have to battle these two forces, militancy that could get a person killed and resistance, also dangerous, that pushed back on the oppression and at times made it diminish. While there are more stories about her childhood and teen years that help us know who this woman was, I'm gonna fast forward again to her adult years. Unsurprisingly, with the upbringing that she had, Parks became an organizer and an investigator for the Montgomery NAACP, which stands for National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, one of the very few places that where we retain that language that I talked about earlier of colored people. In the 1940s, Parks used her passion for justice to investigate incidents of sexual assault against Black women, something that law enforcement systemically ignored. In the summer of 1955, Parks spent two weeks at the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. The Highlander School was a place for black and white activists to train and to plan. At this point, 42 years old, Parks had been an organizer for years, but was kind of down on what seemed like little to no change for the circumstances of black people in Alabama. For those two weeks at the center, she worked at plans for desegregating the schools, but didn't have much hope for any kind of change in Montgomery. And then that December, there was the bus. Parks refused to give up her seat for a white man, the third African-American woman within a year to do so. Like the other women before her, she was arrested. The next day, the Women's Political Council, which had been strategizing for over a year about desegregating the buses, called for a one-day boycott. So this had been the plan all along. As people began to mobilize, the 26-year-old pastor of Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Martin King, was elected as the president of the newly formed Montgomery Improvement Association. The one day boycott was extended. The word on the street was, don't ride the bus, walk, carpool. Black taxi drivers supported the boycott, accepting 10 cents per ride, which was the same fare as the bus in order to help people be able to go to work, but not ride the bus. The boycott lasted for 380 days. It was a win, with the federal district court eventually declaring segregation unconstitutional and the Supreme Court upholding that decision. The irony of the situation is by the time of the mass meetings to organize the boycott after Park's arrest, her voice in history was diminished. Many of the participants of the civil rights movement have acknowledged much of the visible leadership, including those whose voices were heard at the gatherings and those who spoke for the movement. They have, they have acknowledged that those voices were very often the men in the movement, but the women were there and the young people were there. Ordinary people were there. Scores of ordinary people, they were the ones who made the bus boycott a success. And this is the genius of movements. They are made of people. There is no lone superstar that single-handedly pulled this campaign off. It's so important for us to remember this as we face the work that we have 
for our own time, for our generation. James Cone, the architect of Black liberation theology, in a lecture at Princeton Theological Seminary titled The Relationship of the Christian Faith to Political Praxis, said this, for liberation theologians, faith and praxis belong together because faith can only be expressed in a political commitment to the humanization of society. We believe, he goes on, that inherent in faith is the love of God, and the latter can only be manifested in the love of one's neighbor. neighbor. Therefore, he goes on, Gustavo Gutierrez writes, to know God is to do justice. Cohn continues, it is not enough to say that the love of God is inseparable from the love of one's neighbor. It must be added that the love of God is unavoidably expressed through the love of one's neighbor. In the summer of 2020, just a few months into the global pandemic, a black man named George Floyd was killed by a police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. The news of Floyd's death sparked nationwide and even international protest over the ongoing reality of the deaths of unarmed black people at the hands of police officers. Because the pandemic had upended life for so many people who found themselves confined to their homes, there was room in their lives to pay attention to this incident in ways that we had not seen for decades. As I watched the way, mostly on social media, the way that people processed George Floyd's death and also the deaths that had happened in the early months of 2020 of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey. Taylor was asleep at home when police invaded the home. Aubrey was jogging in a white neighborhood and was cornered and shot to death by men who didn't want black people in the neighborhood. As I watched people process this, these incidents and race relations in the US and other countries in general, I confess that I felt very despondent over the fact that it seemed that for many people, this was brand new information. People were expressing their shock and dismay and surprise over issues that I had been speaking and teaching and writing about for several decades. I needed the reminder that this work is indeed for the long haul and long haul strategies, including education are needed. We as a human family need to learn and relearn our history. We need to employ what we know about identity formation from our communities, from our faith communities, our cultural communities, just as systems of oppression form and reform generations of people into participating and perpetuating unjust structures. They are taught that this is the way that life is. They are taught that society is better organized in this way and we need your participation, your active participation in it, or at least we need you to not try to upset the system because we think it works very well. Just a few weeks ago, my students and I watched a portion of a documentary about nonviolent resistance movements. One segment titled, We Were Warriors, recounts the way that college students in Nashville, Tennessee desegregated the lunch counters in downtown Nashville in 1960. Their strategies included preparation that was just as intentional as soldiers preparing for battle, hence the title, we were warriors. The students in Nashville, the college students in Nashville and the elders they were mentored by knew the campaign to desegregate lunch counters would be long. The strategy was on the surface, very, very simple. They would go to the lunch counters every day at lunchtime, at lunchtime and sit down. They knew that they would be told that they couldn't be served. They knew that they would be ignored. They knew that they would be harassed. And yet they kept coming week after week. They also knew that eventually they would likely be arrested. They knew violence against their bodies was probable. 
They attended evening classes on nonviolent action. They had practiced sitting stone-faced and silent as they were yelled at, called names, hit and knocked down. They knew what they signed up for and they kept coming to those lunch counters week after week. The lawyer that represented the students who were arrested had his house bombed. He and his family were not harmed. They weren't there. Later that day, the day of the bombing, 3,000 people marched to City Hall. What had previously been mostly college students grew in numbers as Black people and people who supported them in Nashville joined the campaign. Upon reaching City Hall, one of the college students, Diane Nash, pointedly on camera asked the mayor, do you feel that it is wrong to discriminate against a person solely on the basis of their race or color. The mayor admitted that he did indeed think it was wrong. This wasn't about face because previously he had supported the, the lunch counter owners and managers in their persistence of not serving the black students or any black people. And so he admitted that he did indeed think it was wrong. He did this about face. Three weeks later, the lunch counters were serving black people. The sit-ins had lasted from February 10th to May 13th. The Montgomery bus boycott and the Nashville protests were two of the more prominent actions taken by local folks in their communities to cause systemic change. Their visibility and their tenacity played a critical role in desegregation across the country. The ripple effects of these localized movements made the decade of the 60s so dynamic in the way that these previously segregated places, not just lunch counters, not just buses, but hospitals and schools and all sorts of institutions that people need to, to orchestrate their lives, they began to fall away. As you heard in the introduction, my colleague Tobin Miller Shearer and I have been doing anti-racism work for about 30 years. And we just published a book exploring what we call an anti-racist spirituality because we wanted to reflect on what we had found helpful and necessary in our long-term work. My colleagues in this work will tell you that in the early days, just about every week, I was like, I quit, I'm not doing this anymore, it's too hard. But I kept coming back, mostly because I was doing the work in the context of community. As we define it in this book, spirituality in this sense is a turning toward the divine for sustenance, solace, and resilience. As such, rather than a focus on doctrine or creed, the way we are using the word spirituality moves outside any given religious tradition or ecclesial structure. And at the same time, we note that spirituality is greater than the sum of psychology and culture or society. Instead, it draws on what many people speak of as mystery, that thing that is outside of my human knowledge and experience, but I, I sense that it is there and that it is working in my life. Marked by a commitment to truth telling, this is happening, this is our history, this is really what's going on, a grounding in community and a fostering of joy, we argue in that book that an anti-racist spirituality fosters and empowers work to dismantle racism and white supremacy for the long haul, because as we have discovered and as the stories that I've shared have instructed me, this work is generational, generation after generation picks up this work. And you can certainly think about parallels in other systems of injustice and oppression where the work is long-term, generational, ongoing, and needs sustenance. The gains made during past racial justice movements have come about through these long-term sustained organizing efforts that do span several generations. For example, the Supreme Court's 
1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision to end legalized segregation in schools resulted from a half century long legal strategy based out of Howard University's law school. It's why Howard University started a law program so that lawyers could be trained because they couldn't go to the white schools. So they had to build a school to create lawyers to, um, to end legalized segregation in education. So these long-term struggles, whether lesser known or high profile people, many of them gained strength from spiritual resources. And as I come to my conclusion, we have seen and talk about how their examples it suggest five ways to dismantle racism through this idea of spirituality shoring us up, bolstering us up from the work. And the five points are these. One is to build community. Change comes about through communities of resistance who foster more than just bodies and minds by putting spirituality at the center. Those folks who walked hundreds of thousands of collective miles to avoid riding public transportation during the Montgomery bus boycott join together on a nightly basis to draw strength and resilience from each other and share in their spiritual traditions. They sang, they prayed, they preached, they ate food together, they laughed together, they cried together uh, through more than a year's worth of boycotting. None of them were lone rangers. The second thing that we note is that accepting the discipline of accountability, to whom are we accountable? To what people do we do this work? Why do we do this work? The world's religions share several core principles in common, and one of them is best described as ego ab abatement, dying to self, being accountable for the demanding work of ending oppression. And so the principle of accountability in a spiritual frame calls us to build on relationships and networks and hold our egos in check as we do so. We also say that we think that it has been helpful for us to walk deeper into rather than away from racial identity, rather than moving towards an idea of color blindness, to embrace our identities and to pay attention to them. And we say that what has felt true for us is that a deeper engagement with racial identities in all, their, all of their complexity bolsters up the work. It is an anti-racist spirituality. The work that Tobin and I have done together has crossed racial lines for more than three decades. We have never once forgotten that we have res our respective identities as a black woman and a white man as we have written, spoken, and done workshops together. The fourth principle is to do the work with joy. The lives of the spiritual giants whose legacies have stood the test of time have almost universally been marked by joy and laughter. And early on in our work together with the cohort of other folks that have joined in this work with us, we said to each other early on, if we can't laugh with each other, if we can't embrace joy and love each other as human beings and have fun together, then this work is not doing, it is not sustainable. And that has been a bolster. And then the fifth one is to recognize and look for and call out the sacred in the midst of struggle. Those small miracles that happen, those movements that, that uh, open up, that open up places, the new realities, to recognize those, to look for those. Novelist and essayist Alice Walker once wrote, anyone can observe the Sabbath, but making it holy surely takes the rest of the week. The work of dismantling racism through spirituality makes the weekdays holy as well. And so as I come to a close, I will say that what I have learned, what I feel is very, very true for the work that I do, and the work that I witness others do is that our resistance needs resilience and that we have to foster the resilience as part of 
who we are. The part of the work for change that we may miss, especially in a context where the expectation for so many things is instant gratification, we might miss the need to build up the capacity to stay in the struggle for justice for a long time, to know what our role is, and to be grounded in community because we were never meant to do this work alone. Writer, historian, and activist Rebecca Solnit writes about this in her book that I highly, highly, highly recommend, Hope in the Dark, Untold Mysteries, Untold, Untold Histories, Wild Possibilities. She writes, cause and effect assume history marches forward, but history is not an army. It is a crab scuttling sideways, a drop of soft water wearing away stone, an earthquake breaking centuries of tension. Sometimes one person inspires a movement or her words do decades later. Sometimes a few passionate people change the world. Sometimes they start a mass movement and millions do. Sometimes those millions are stirred by the same outrage or the same idea and change comes upon us like a change of weather. All that these transformations have in common is that they begin in the imagination, in hope. To hope is to gamble. It is to bet on the future, on your desires, on the possibility that an open heart and uncertainty is better than gloom and safety. To hope is dangerous, and yet it is the opposite of fear, for to live is to risk. I say all this because hope is not a lottery ticket. You can sit on the sofa and clutch feeling lucky. I say it because Hope is an ax you break down doors with in an emergency because hope should shove you out the door because it will take everything you have to enter the future away from endless war for the annihilation of the earth's treasures and the grinding down of the poor and marginal. Hope means just another world might be possible, not promised, not guaranteed. Hope calls for action. Action is impossible without hope, end quote. May we believe hope is possible. May we have the sustenance to keep us hopeful and to keep us doing our collective work. Thank you for having me share my words with you tonight. Well, thank you very much for sharing them with us. It was uh, very stimulating and it, it you know, the themes of resiliency and militancy and uh, hope definitely been items of conversation here. So I think you're speaking directly into conversations that, that we have. And so thank you for sharing uh, your expertise and your work.